the subject of our panel discussion and the discussion that is going to ensue over the next 60 minutes is about the energy transition. So here we are transitioning between panels, I think, fairly quickly. So that sort of sets the tone for what's to come. But a very, a very warm welcome to everybody here. This is our CNBC Internet of Things, Powering the Digital Economy debate. And today we will be talking about where we stand, where things stand with the energy transition. Now, I was in Davos in 2020, and we were having similar discussions, but a lot of things have happened in the last three years. Uh, there's been a pandemic, we've had a COVID shock, which incidentally was actually a good thing for global emissions because they dropped in 2020. But in 2021, 2022, as economies fired back, demand came back, and we've seen a rise again in CO2 emissions. Just to give you some numbers here, uh, the Global Carbon Project estimates that CO2 emissions from energy are, are expected to increase by around 1% in 2022. This will be slightly more than the previous record of 2019. China is responsible for the majority of those emissions, accounting for 32%, followed by the US with 14%, and the EU and India both with 8%. So this is where things stand today. There's been a lot of talk about the energy transition, but unfortunately, emissions continue to rise. So where do we stand? How are things looking? Has our drive for energy security been sacrificed at the altar of sustainability? So first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Olivier Blum, who is the executive vice president of Schneider Electric's energy management business. He is responsible for the entire energy management portfolio of world leading technologies, software, and services. Uh, Great to chat to you. This is a really important topic. I thought it was really interesting that in the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report, over a 10-year horizon, the top out of the top five risks, four of them are climate change related. How do you think we're doing as far as the energy transition is concerned? Well, look, as you said, to be positive, we are doing much better today than a couple of years ago. You know, we at Schneider have embarked 15 years ago in that really uh, carbon transition. Uh, we have published our first carbon footprint for our own company. 10 years ago, approximately. If, just to give you a simple number, in 2018, you had less than 100 companies in the world who were committed to become net zero. Today, you have a couple of thousand people. Second point to be very positive, a few years ago, it was only a European story. Most of those companies were coming from Europe. As of today, you have 60% coming from Europe, 20 mm. from North America, and 20% from the rest of the world. So if you take really the very positive, you yeah. have a very large number of companies which are committed. Government everywhere in the world have committed. But if I draw a comparison, it's like you organize a big event, you invite people to register. So we have, let's say, 20% of the people who have registered, but we have not yet started the game. So yeah. that's where we are. Now, compared mm. to 2015, which was a year of the Paris Agreement, it took three, four years to get started. Now we have started, but really the big, big, big challenge is still in front of us. Mm. Olivier, one thing people say about these uh, COP targets is that they're simply targets. And it's great to have these targets, but if you don't have a strategy to accompany those targets, then you're not actually achieving much. Do you think enough work is being done in terms of implementing strategies to help get us to that destination? You, you mentioned the target, it's a very important point, because if you look at those couple of thousand companies who have made a public commitment to become net zero, once you have those targets in your company, you have to go through. So to your point, we say that at Schneider Electric, you have to strategize, you have to digitize, you have mm -hmm. to decarbonize. Yes, mm -hmm. you need to put a strategy. But once your commitment is in front, really, of your employees, of your partner, of your shareholders, you need to get started. And, and guess what? One year later, you need to disclose your CO2 emissions, scope one, two, and three. Year two, you need to demonstrate that you have made progresses. So it's super important. You have to start somewhere. But mm -hmm. you're absolutely right to insist on one point. We have to deal with energy transition and carbon like we deal with any other topic in a company. Yeah. As a chairman, CEO, board, executive committee, you have a strategy for your business, for your supply chain, for your HR. Now, every single company in the world should have a strategy for energy transition and define a long-term vision, a short-term vision mm. on how you make it happen. Mm. It's so much of this, the discussion when you bring up uh, this topic seems to be centered around energy supply. But of course, the other side of the equation is energy demand and energy use accounts for about 80% of the world's global greenhouse emissions, at least in, in the EU and in the US. That is a staggeringly high number, that's 80%. So what can be done also to make our energy usage more efficient? 
I, I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> because if you look at the public, if you hear about the public de debate today, it's mainly about supply. Yeah. And I think it was very important for a period of time that we focus on the supply, how we decarbonize the supply, how we bring more renewable to the table. That's very important. By the way, as a company, to be very practical, when you embark in your decarbonization, you look at your scope one and two, and very, very quickly you jump on renewable. So it was very important, and we need to continue to focus on it. Now, close to half of the past 1.5 is about the demand. Mm -hmm. And demand, to oversimplify, you can divide it in three parts. It's about energy efficiency, circularity, and electrification. Electrification of process for industry, electrification of cars, electrification mm -hmm. of your heating system at home. So those three dimensions represent close to half of the pathway to 1.5. And I mm -hmm. don't think people are paying enough attention today on the demand side of the equation, which is, by the way, easy to do, yeah. which is effective. We always speak about what's the cost of sustainability. By the way, if you consume less, you pay less at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So on top of that, from a financial standpoint, it's very easy to demonstrate why this mm. side of the equation is very good well, for the decarbonization, but also from a cost standpoint. Turning over to Europe, it's quite interesting because over the course of 2022, consumers and, and also industries had to make difficult decisions. They had to cut down on energy consumption simply because it was so expensive. There was a market pricing mechanism that was at play. Do you think that this structural lower use for energy is going to be a, a continuous feature in, in future years, should even if energy prices go back to where they were pre pre-war, pre-energy crisis? Well, look, if there is one thing nobody can predict in the world is what will be the cost of energy today and in the future. But, but, but your point is very important. The energy crisis we have been all going went through in 2022 has been really a catalyst. It has been an acceleration. What is super important is while we in the short term try to reduce the cost of energy by consuming less, we should never drop on the other goal, which is a long-term goal of the CO2 emission. Now, when you combine the two, Definitely that put more pressure on the people. We believe it's good at Schneider mm. because we have been pre preaching for decarbonization for the past 15 years. Mm. Now I think there is really an incentive for people, company to go faster and it's great. Mm. Well, before we wrap up, I just want to, I guess my, my end point is similar to where I started. And the fact, you know, the reality is that China and the US and EU, India account for the lion's share of global emissions. So there needs to be a group drive to get this under control. It can't just be the EU going at it alone. It can't just be the US going at it alone. What responsibility do corporations and also governments have to make this a global drive to decarbonize? Huge, and I will not comment too much on government. Government, government have made commitment, but I think your question is very relevant for corporate. You take company like Schneider and other multinational. We operate everywhere in the world. When you commit to become net zero, you commit across your entire supply chain. Mm. For instance, it means that you have to tackle all your uh, scope three upstream emission. And what it is, it's about embarking your supplier. And guess what? Whether you are a French, American, Indian, and Chinese company, you have supplier everywhere in the world. So I think corporate has a huge responsibility and scope three emission represent usually 80% of your total emission. Yeah. So corporate has a big, big responsibility, definitely, and again, Back to the beginning of our conversation, the more company will commit to net zero, the more they will embark an ecosystem of supplier, and that will make it happen, not only for the large company, but also for small and medium-sized company. All right, well, that's a great place to leave it. And also, a nice end point before our next panel discussion. Olivier Blum, thank you very much for chatting to us. Now, I am going to throw to a scene setter video, and I think this is going to be a nice sort of background for what we're about to discuss. I've got uh, a very esteemed panel coming up with uh, four different panelists. We're going to talk about that shortly. But first, let's just watch the video and then we'll talk about some of the uh, takeaways. The energy crisis, exacerbated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, is causing profound and long lasting changes to policies and energy markets around the world. Could the current situation become an historic turning point towards a cleaner and more secure energy system, whilst also keeping the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal alive? There is tougher times ahead. There is also good news for the green transition. We are forced by high energy prices to be more energy efficient. And this higher energy fuel, uh, fossil fuel based prices also make renewables more competitive. As countries face energy security concerns, the IEA's Renewables 2022 report suggests an increased move to renewables could double in worldwide capacity in the next five years. 
to reduce reliance on imported fossil fuels. This energy crisis is accelerating the investment on clean energy. We have governments trying to protect consumers from the impacts of the energy crisis. The energy crisis is pushing everyone to invest in renewables because they are the ones that are under local and domestic control. As the shift to renewables gains momentum, increasing energy efficiency by reducing energy waste is a critical factor for both the clean energy transition and our net zero ambitions. It turns out in the United States and in Europe, roughly two thirds of primary energy is lost. That is one of the most fundamental problems that this huge wake up call that Europe has now had, I think will bring to the surface. Slowing climate change will be impossible without reducing global reliance on fossil fuels. And this requires increased investment from governments and the private sector, with many arguing that there was insufficient progress made at COP27. We need to pivot into a clean energy matrix. We need to take our power sector, our transport sector, our industry sectors, and literally move them rapidly towards a clean energy matrix. That's the only way to bring carbon emissions down. According to the IPCC, it's now or never to bend the curve on emissions. What policies must be put in place now to speed up the global energy transition? And how can business leaders, policymakers, and civil society work together to turn commitments and strategies into meaningful action? Welcome to CNBC's IoT Powering the Digital Economy debate as we focus on the energy transition needed to meet the world's climate goals. Excellent. Well, that was our scene setter for the upcoming panel. Let me introduce our panelists today. So uh, sitting on my right is Andres Groski, the president and CEO of AES, a top renewables player around the world and in the US as well. Uh, sitting to his right is Elizabeth Gaines, the global ambassador for FFI, that is Fortis U Future Industries, former CEO of Fortis U Metals. On her right, we have Dr. Thomas hones Baworth, the head of sustainability research at Lombard Ordea. And then on his right, we have Kavinch, Zeimler, the chairman of Energisa Energy, one of the leading players in Turkey's emerging electricity market. So I know I've been giving out a lot of statistics here, but I just want to give one more because, again, this is another scene setter for where we're about to head in this discussion. But last year was the fifth warmest year on record globally, with temperatures about 1.2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So that's 1.2 degrees. Remember the target as per set in the Paris Agreement was 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, back in November, The Economist ran an issue um, stating that that 1.5 degrees Celsius target is simply not achievable given the current state of affairs. I don't want to be too dismal, and we are going to come up with some solutions on this panel, but this is where we are right now. So, uh, Thomas, I actually would like to, to start with you, if I may. Um, just describe to us the, the scale of the challenge that is ahead. So one way to compare it to is really as an industrial revolution. We've seen past industrial revolutions, including past energy transitions. What we're really seeing now is the complete transformation of our entire economy. The demand side of our economy, the way we power vehicles, the way we heat our buildings, mm -hmm. the way we use energy in, in industry, all of that needs to be transformed. And we're looking at investment needs in the trillions of dollars, roughly comparable to mm -hmm. the amount that actually we've been spending on the IT, the digital revolution. Yeah. So we're talking about something of a similar order of magnitude as that quite phenomenal transition in our economy. What role do you think has the private sector played or not played in investing enough in this, these types of technologies? So the private sector is one of the sources of solutions here as well. There's a lot of innovation coming from the private sector, from all parts, from the supply side of the economy, providing green renewable power, the demand side of the economy. And new solutions are emerging as well. And what it is driving is a very rapid reduction in the cost mm -hmm. of some of these technologies. Yeah. We've seen batteries become cheaper, solar power is the cheapest mm -hmm. form of energy on the planet, electric mm -hmm. vehicles, heat mm -hmm. pumps mm -hmm. are becoming cheaper. And as these technologies become cheaper, we see very rapid increase in adoption of these technologies. Uh, Andres, can I turn to you? Because um, you, know, you have a lot of expertise, of course, on the topic of renewables. Uh, 
Are you discouraged by the, the, what we're witnessing, what we have witnessed in the last couple of years in terms of global emissions? No, I'm actually more encouraged. Um, in the U.S., we passed the Inflation Reduction Act, yes. or IR. Uh, so I think that the U.S. is finally on the right track, mm -hmm. and that's going to cause a great expansion of investment in the sector. And really, it's not, in many cases, it's not additional subsidies. It's just taking what they were approving on a yearly basis and putting it out for 10 years. Mm -hmm. But what we're facing, uh, I very much agree with what the comments just said, is, is a dramatic change. So the, the one thing is that renewables today are the cheapest form of energy in most cases. Mm. The problem is capacity. How do you keep the lights on 24-7? And that's where you have to use lithium-ion batteries on a daily basis. But to really get to a complete decarbonization, we're going to need green hydrogen. We'll probably need small modular nukes, et cetera. And I also agree very much that what we need is for uh, renewables to be more than just competitive, just better. So mm -hmm. there'd be lower cost, uh, equal in quality. And that, that's honestly what the corporate sector is demanding very much and many mm -hmm. consumers. So I think this has to be, you know, not just top down. It has to be that it's a superior product mm -hmm. and, and people want it. And truthfully, if you included all the costs of fossil fuels, all the externalities, it, I think it would be probably a killer app today. A? A killer app. And that's what, mm. in, in the IT sector, when right. you come up with a solution that's just okay. superior, it's a killer <laughs> yeah. app because it. it kills the existing uh, applications. Yeah. yeah. So do you agree with the IEA, the International Energy uh, Agency's assessment, that despite the horrendous war that is happening in Ukraine, one of the positives out of it is that Europe, for example, has accelerated their drive for moving towards renewables. Um, in the States, it's really been the IRA. The thing I think with Europe, there's been a huge disruption of supply. Yeah. And so people have that's been- short term versus long term. Yes, scrambling. Yeah. So I, I think that that's hurt you know, consumers and that's hurt the program. So I think in the long term, yes, mm. because it's kind of woke up of the problems of, of relying on Russian gas. And even from an ecological point of view, I always had some doubts about Russian gas because you're bringing it across six time frames across leaky pipelines. And you know, we don't do enough of the math about what's the actual, if, if you have like a 10% methane leak, then gas plants are worse than coal plants. So I, th I think what we need is you know, more fundamental science here. But so at the long run, yes. Short run, I think it's disrupted things a lot. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you see that with the likes of Germany, for example, firing up coal plants again, exactly. a very difficult decision-making process. Elizabeth, I'd like to turn to you. I wish you could just sort of explain to us what the FFI initiative is. And I know that there are big ambitions. You want to be one of the greenest uh, energy providers in the world. I've got to say, it does sound a bit incompatible with the fact that is Fortescue, a, what is known as a, a mining company, how does a mining company become one of the biggest green energy providers in the world? Well, mining is an incredibly innovative industry, and people think of it as you know, heavy diggers and equipment, but mm. actually the use of digital uh, and remote and, and uh, autonomy in the mining sector uh, is second to none. And so we've got a lot of experience in dealing with innovation and the application of new technologies. And we're seeing, our, our ambition is twofold. So one is, yes, we want to be a significant supplier of green energy, and we see green hydrogen as being, uh, playing an important role, and, and we intend to export green hydrogen to those markets where we're seeing enormous demand, partly because of the energy crisis globally. But we're also decarbonizing our mining operations. Mm -hmm. And we have a goal, it's not a net zero goal by 2030, it's a real zero goal by 2030. And to do that, we have to be innovative, we've got to adopt new technologies, we have to rethink how we mine, but we're one of the, I think, the only large industrial companies that is taking a real zero approach by 2030. And in doing so, we will eliminate the use of about a billion litres of diesel every year. Mm. Um, now, we need to transition our haul trucks, our trains, all of our mining equipment, but we've got a path to do that, and we're investing $6.2 billion between now and 2030, uh, in that, over that process, we will generate savings of about $3 billion, so it's about a net $3 billion. And thereafter, the savings to our business will be close to a $1 billion a year. Yeah. So it's not just the right thing to do, it's actually the smart thing to do, and it does mitigate those risks of supply of energy, cost of energy, escalating <laughs> um, uh, mm. costs. So I think if, if we can demonstrate 
that a company like Fortescue can do this, mm. then there is absolutely no reason why other companies mm. and large industrial companies can't mm. follow that lead. Yeah. And we're prepared to make that technology available because yeah. it's critically important. It's, it's really interesting what you're saying about the return on investment. Um, I, I interviewed Capgemini a couple of days ago. The CEO was on our show. And they had released a survey in the morning showing that only 21% of the 500 companies that they surveyed actually believed that the benefits of investing in the sustainable future outweighed the costs. That's a really low number. So it does entail a lot of upfront investment. But the question is, do investors, are, are they going to hold on? Are they going to be patient enough to see the return on investment over the medium term? Well, I would question the modelling of some of those companies and the assumptions mm. that they're making about the future cost of energy, the availability of energy, mm. the introduction of carbon charges. If we factor in all of those potential new costs that we don't currently have in our business, but we know that with the change in regulatory environments with government policy, that we could see a rapidly escalating uh, cost environment. So for those companies that are saying they can't make the economics work, they just haven't looked at it in the right way. And I don't mm. think they're, they're taking a a future-facing view. They're actually mm -hmm. looking at it based on today's assumptions. Mm -hmm. Andres, you sound, you sound yeah. like you wanted to no, jump no, in. Yeah. <laughs> what I was going to say, mm -hmm. in our case, we've taken a much more aggressive uh, position about reducing carbon emissions than the rest of our sector in the States. A lot of them are catching up now. Uh, and just to say that investors, we're growing the fastest. Our renewable sector is growing about 25% a year. But our stock has also been the best performer in the utility sector in the last five years. Mm -hmm. So I think investors are starting to get it. Yeah. So at the beginning, um, was there was skepticism? Hard. Pardon? There was skepticism at the beginning? Yeah, laughter sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about yeah. lithium ion batteries that roll their mm -hmm. eyes, like, tell me about the next quarter. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say within certainly the last three years, that, that has changed. Mm -hmm. And so being ahead, like she said, can be very good business. But yes, you do have to get that that first stage of getting investors comfortable. It's, it's not easy to be the first. Mm. No. Mm. Ikvanch, I want to turn to you. I, I actually, uh, I'm reminded, I wasn't going to ask this question, but I'm just reminded now of a, a geographical map I looked at around the time of the uh, European parliamentary elections. And I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because they did this map of all of Europe, and they asked all of these countries to rate, in terms of importance, what matters most going into those elections. And what you found invariably is that the richer, so to speak, countries from the north were more worried about green and the transition, and the poorer countries from the south were worried about the economy, immigration, other issues, etc. The reason I'm putting this to you is because for a long time people say that being able to even think about cleaning and, and moving towards a greener economy is a luxury that only richer countries can enjoy. Because if you are in an emerging market economy, you're focused on very high levels of inflation, cost of living crisis, et cetera, et cetera. And when you look at the proportion of investment, most of it is happening in advanced economies. What role do you think emerging markets have to play here? Thank you for the question. For the last two, three days, we are talking around energy and the energy trilemma, the supply security, the affordability, of the energy and the climate. And uh, until a short time ago, we were talking about renewables just for the climate impact, uh, no emissions. But today we talk about uh, renewables, about to secure our supply, as well as for the affordability, for the cost of the renewables. And as indicated in the International Energy Agency report, it is not impossible, but it is very, very, very challenging. Because we have not taken the necessary steps Mm. All together. Mm. When I say all together, I mean the developed countries, developing countries, as well as the underdeveloped countries, mm -hmm. where one billion people have no access to electricity, or 2.5 billion people have no good standards of cooking. So uh, during uh, COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, uh, there have been uh, good decisions taken and good initiatives started, like the hydrogen agreement, memorandum of understanding between. Europe and Middle Eastern countries, bilateral agreements, etc. And also, well, uh, damage and loss uh, fund has been defined. But we have defined only the what question, the mm -hmm. how. The answer to how is still missing. Mm -hmm. And here, the Inflation Reduction Act in US is, is a good program to promote the activities, the efficiency programs, investments in the US. 
Repower in the EU is another strong program promoting especially efficiency, but developing countries especially have other needs, have other priorities. The developing countries have to subsidize the energy prices for the afford affordability. The governments have to secure the supply for their citizens, for the industrial development. In the meantime, make it affordable for them, not only for the citizens, mm -hmm. but also for the industries to be competitive enough. Because the cost of energy is more or less the same for all the countries. Mm -hmm. But the GDP that the developing countries are creating is less than the developed countries. So there's mm -hmm. a gap. So the solution seems, in my opinion, uh, a positive uh, approach to developing countries in the financing. Yeah of the energy transition projects. At the end of the day, it all comes down to cost, doesn't it? So Thomas said, let me put that question to you. Is clean energy affordable at the scale that is required? The answer to the question is very rapidly shifting. And today I would say, yes, it has become the cheapest mm -hmm. source of energy. What I think the market at large is underestimating is simply the pace at which this transition is evolving. And we've done some work looking at past technological revolutions, whether it's the adoption of steamships, mm. of mobile phones, mm. uh, any piece of major sort of new technology of infrastructure. And all of these transitions have tended to follow very similar patterns. They unfold very slowly at once, and then the transition completes in the span of 10 to 20 years. Mm. Yet if you look today at what the market is anticipating, how long it will take us to electrify our buildings, to electrify our vehicle fleet, the time frames there are still much longer. We don't seem to be drawing the lessons that when mm. a new superior technology emerges, that becomes cost competitive, that rollout can happen very quickly. Mm. Uh, I, I also, I'm, I'm, I keep talking about some of the interviews I've done, but I'm here in Davos and interviewing lots of interesting people, uh, and, and they've given me some unique perspectives. And I was speaking to uh, one of the automakers uh, in India, Mahindra, and they were talking about their hopes for faster EV rollouts and adoption within India, he has high targets. Currently, 1% EV penetration is the total market. He thinks it's going to be 25% in the next five to 10 years. So quickly growing. But I think you know, that's just one example of a cleaner form of transportation. But on one side, you can supply the vehicle, but you need the accompanying infrastructure to go around with it. You need the charging grids. You need to make sure that the battery charging time is, is faster. All of that, Thomas, do you think that is it moving fast enough? Is the infrastructure build around the solutions that are coming? Is that moving fast enough as well? You need the ecosystem, not just the solution. I think you're absolutely right. This is why we like to think of this as a true system change. You're not going to get there by making isolated interventions. And yes, you do need multiple stakeholders, policymakers, industry investors to work together. And in some areas, that's working better than in others. And sometimes it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. We create some very powerful feedback loops in this system. Renewable energy created the environmental case for electric vehicles. That created the market for batteries. Now, because these batteries have been so cheap, we're putting that back with the renewable power and actually improving the economics there. Mm. So it can also be the case that these multiple different parts of the system actually reinforce each other mm. as well. Andres, if I asked you to fast forward, I don't know, 20 years, or actually forget about that. If you had to paint a picture of your ideal energy mix composition for the world, sources of energy, what would the breakdown look like? Will it ever be 100% renewables? Oh, that, that, that's a great question. Um, I think what's very important <coughs> is to see the, the drastic reduction in greenhouse gases yeah. as fast as possible, as soon as possible. Uh, I guess what concerns me the most is the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And it's just that if you look at the amount of lithium that's needed, mm -hmm. you know, it has to expand by a factor of 40 from that of 20. Uh, when you look at the amount of copper, it has to expand by a factor of four. So th these are humongous numbers. Yeah. So I do think it has a lot of things similar to sort of a digital revolution mm. in terms that renewables are superior. But, but you're talking about actually uh, mineral resources. These are, you know, there's a, there's a finite supply. That's exactly the point. That, that and differentiating it from the digital is that the amount of these resources that are needed are, are vast much more than, say, the digital revolution. Mm. Because the, the one thing that's wonderful about the digital revolution is that the marginal cost of supplying one more is zero once mm. you have the app up and running. So that, I think, is, is the concern to me. And it need not be the same solution everywhere. Mm. Um, it will be different in different countries. For example, where you have 
well-built out grids, a lot of this is how to use the, the energy more intelligently. So algorithms for energy efficiency, people becoming prosumers with their electric cars, there's a lot you can do there. Mm. But if you said, go to Africa, and some place that ha doesn't have electricity, and mm. a lot of rural Africa does not have electricity, the solution would be different. It'd be mm. distributed, it'd be totally mm. renewable. You don't have to recreate the grid that exists in the, in the developed countries. But renewables really are, uh, I think, again, getting that face, because look at what India's doing. 450 gigawatts is the goal that Modi set out. Yeah. And also, quite frankly, China was a developing country. Mm. And look at the amount of renewables that they're building. Mm. So I think that we're building enormous amounts. My, my concern is that, you know, is there enough of the physical stuff, mm. you know, the raw materials yeah. to get that done, mm. and in some cases, even the labor force. Yeah. So what our, the approach of AES is really look at where the bottlenecks are. Mm. So for example, uh, coming up with robotics for building solar farms for the labor shortages, mm. coming up with prefab solar, which takes half the space, it can be built in a third of the time. We already had come out with the lithium ion batteries for energy storage. So really looking at these bottlenecks, oh, also AI, you know, mm. for, for efficiency application. So mm. that's what I think is needed. And the private sector, you know, unleashed can do so many things. Yeah. So I think the government, what it has to do is help create a framework. But in, in most of the places, it's, it's much more, you know, don't get in the way, honestly, of the new technologies. Can I just ask you a quick question before I go to mm. Elizabeth? I want to talk about green hydrogen. But before that, I want to ask you about natural gas, because there, mm -hmm. there seems to be differing views as to whether or not it's a destination source of energy, destination fuel, mm -hmm. or transition fuel. What is your opinion on, on that gas and where it yes. fits into the decarbonization drive? Yeah, I feel very confident in saying that for the next 20 years, we need natural gas. Now, what we can start to do today is to start to blend it with green hydrogen. Okay. So mm -hmm. we're running tests that you can blend it up to, say, 20% in existing mm -hmm. turbines. Um, and new turbines are coming out that, that can burn, you know, much higher percentages to it. But it's just difficult to see that you're going to have enough green hydrogen to substitute it like the next 10 years. Yeah. We announced the first mega-scale green hydrogen project in the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's a $4 billion investment together with air products. Mm -hmm. So it seems large. Oh one and a half gigawatts of power, wind power to, to produce it. That can supply 0.1% of the US long haul trucking fleet. Mm. So if you wanted to <laughs> eliminate, give you that, you need yeah, a thousand of them. It's not enough. Just for the states. So the same thing with natural gas. So I do think it's a transition fuel, mm -hmm. but I think that, you know, it's hard for me to see the next 20 years, mm. the grids that I know working without some amount of natural gas. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. Elizabeth, I would love to hear your thoughts on green hydrogen. I know that FFI is huge in that space. I also note that uh, over here in Europe, you've signed a deal with the German government to supply the continent up to the country, I should say, with up to 5 million tons of green hydrogen by 2030. So tell yes, us more so, about that. So our, our plans, are, we, we see green hydrogen as playing probably the most important role in the energy transition. Mm -hmm. um, and. And so we're, we're developing those facilities, you know, similar to the you know, conversation then about the, the largest um, you know, um, installation of renewable energy to produce hydrogen. We're building the world's largest electrolyzer manufacturing facility in Queensland at two gigawatts per annum. So we, we see hydrogen having play an important role. And I think for that, for that same reason as well, because a lot of the activities, whether it's heavy transport or mining sector, there are no established grids. I mean, we actually have to have energy that can support those harder to electrify um, industries. And, that, and mm. uh, green hydrogen will play an important role. But what we're actually seeing in Europe, and Germany is a good example, particularly um, with the uh, conflict in the Ukraine, mm. is that there is a huge demand for um, you know, green, renewable energy that has security of supply. Yeah. Um, and that takes away that, you know, that um, the mm. challenges that we're currently seeing around that security of supply of fossil fuel. Mm. So we're seeing very strong demand, but it needs obviously significant investment. And mm. I think to the point earlier around the um, resources that are needed to support the green transition and similar to um, the production of green hydrogen, we need to work closely with government and regulators. I mean, it's one thing to say we need yep. more lithium, we need more copper. Of course. But you can't do that without getting the approvals. Mm. And you need the regulatory mm. approvals, the environmental approvals. Mm. You know, these things do take mm. time. And, mm. and we wouldn't want 
that to be the bottleneck in the energy transition, similar to the skills and resources that we need. So this is going to take a very coordinated effort, mm. working with governments, making sure we have the mm. pathways to realise those ambitions. Mm. Um, green hydrogen is going to be a significant export market mm. for Australia, but for example. People usually say that green hydrogen is, is quite expensive. So. How, how do you bring that lower? How do you bring the cost of it lower? Well, people said that about iron ore when we first started mining iron yeah. ore. And at that time, it, it cost us about $50 a tonne yeah. to produce iron ore. And now it's, it's $18. So, so what do we need to see so for it to scale. become... You need you scale. You need technology. Yeah. You need innovation. So we've used autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, we call it the flywheel. I mean, we started at $50. Then we, have, mm. we produce more. We get the scale. We've got, obviously, the customers. We've, we've used innovation, autonomy, remote operations, and we've seen the cost come down. And mm -hmm. it's a combination of all those things. So the first project that we do may not have the same economics as the second or third or fourth. Yeah. But in our view, scale is going to be important. Yeah. The adoption of, of, of technology and innovation to make sure we bring those costs down. Mm -hmm. And whether that's the way we install renewable energy, or solar, for example, using robotics. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a lot of ways that we can actually make sure that we can reduce those costs mm -hmm. and that we actually see the costs come down. And I think, as I said, I, I think sort of saying, well, it's too expensive. Uh, it, it, it's missing the point that the more that we do and the more scale that we have, we will see green hydrogen play a very important part yeah. in the green energy yeah. transition. As, as with everything. Uh, Kivansh, I, I want to turn to you. Uh, well, Turkey is known also to be quite a sunny country. I've been in the summer. It's, it's lovely in the mm. summer. But also that means that there's a lot of potential for solar power. And um, I saw that the share of electricity produced from solar and wind energy in Turkey accounted for about 21% in, in July 2022. That was maybe it's just one month because it was the summer month. Should be Ma more actually. Should Turkey, be more. Turkey has installed capacity uh, in renewable generation mm. uh, of more than fifty percent. Okay. And the generation is accounting around thirty-five percent, to my best knowledge, mm. in the uh, year total. But uh, also touching the hydrogen, especially yeah. the green hydrogen. Uh, first of all, we have to we need to embrace. We have to welcome. We have to support all the technologies, all the new initiatives, mm. including hydrogen, electric mm. vehicles. When we say we, who? As the world, as the globe, I mean all together, all the people here in Davos, mm. all the governments, all the private sector, all the academia, because mm. we have to think. But it isn't just about supporting it, it's also about putting the money into it. And that, that becomes one of the when issues. The, right projects, the financing. When the projects are there, financing easy, here in this world, no matter of what country, <laughs> what, whether it's a developed country mm. or developing country. Mm. We have to find the right projects. Uh, and we have to work uh, in collaboration, in cooperation, especially around hydrogen. No one knows actually the real roadmap towards a hydrogen. No any institution, no any private sector, no any single company. We have to bring all the uh, right people around the table, academicians, governments, private sectors, players around the entire value chain, including the manufacturing of the electrolyzer, the membranes, uh, the green energy man, uh, producers, the, the users, and all the, all the value chain. And specifically to your question around Turkey, Turkey has a huge solar potential. And in our uh, national roadmap, uh, we see a huge uh, investment in renewable energy. Mm. And believe me, the financing is there. Mm. Because we are one of the largest investors and if we want to invest in renewable energy, we have the access to competitive, sustainable link, sustainable to link financing. Mm. And one more thing, Turkey has the potential to be one of the largest green hydrogen uh, suppliers for Europe, especially for Germany. And we just need to build up the right ecosystem, schedule, plan the roadmap, and show our ambition. Well, when you put it like that, it sounds easy. <laughs> uh, Maybe it is easy. I believe, <laughs> and many people, mm. at least 3,000 3, people who have attended today in Davos, yeah. we all believe. Many others in our companies, in our institution, we all believe it. Mm. And it's just mm. acting together, mm. collaboration yeah. together. 
I think there's also a little bit of selection bias because most of the people who are here in Davos tend to believe in, in these things. Uh, Thomas, I want to turn to you. The reason I just brought that angle up is, uh, look, there has been pushback over sustainability investments. Uh, Andres, you talked yourself at the beginning. Uh, you know, you were often laughed at. You know, first they ridicule you, and then you know, eventually, <laughs> well, especially they, the new technologies. The yeah. new technologies, but. Uh, and the word ESG, a couple of years ago I was here and, and people were talking right. about it as, you know, all of this, there's a wave of optimism in the air and it feels as though the public's perception of ESG in some places has turned a bit negative because there are certain stakeholders who believe that companies who spend too much time talking about their ESG goals are foregoing their financial commitments. So how does that square in to investors' appetite to get involved into these types of technologies, these quote-unquote ESG-friendly technologies? And often, uh, what's publicly traded comes at a premium. Yeah, I think what we've seen is a very rapid evolution in the mindset of investors. A few years ago, the very question why climate change had anything to do with financial reality was an alien question. Mm. We've crossed that bridge, fortunately. Then it became a risk management approach. Oh, we need to integrate ESG considerations just to make sure we won't get caught out. Where I think we're at the cusp of is the realization that integrating at least these forward-looking views as to the direction, the roadmap, the pathway of the economy is the only way you're going to be able to deploy capital effectively if indeed we believe what we're discussing here, that the scale and the pace of this is truly so significant. You do need to do this in the right way, however. The traditional approach to ESG has been to use fairly simplistic metrics, scores, evaluating whether a company has the right policies disclosed on its website. And disclosure and transparency is very important to us, mm. but it's a necessary but not sufficient objective. Mm. What we really want to understand is what's the fundamental business model mm. of these companies? What is this economy going to look like by 2030? And are these two things compatible? And if not, does this company have a credible and ambitious enough transition plan to actually realign its business model to what an economy is going to look like mm. by 2030. Mm. That's a very different and much more forward-looking way mm. of thinking about sustainability and ultimately, I think, more meaningful. Andres, do you have a view mm. on how much monetary value investment is actually needed in these types of technologies and mm. clean, clean technologies to get to our targets? Yes, well, the essence I've seen is that basically we have to be investing to, to reach a sort of 2030 goal that we've talked about in the mm. 2050 goal of, of net zero, we have to be investing the amount of money we've been investing in petroleum and gas. So the world has the resources. But what are those numbers roughly, if you know them? Oh, those are in the trillions. Yeah, I mean, obviously, like yeah, yeah. One and a half trillion dollars mm. a year. Yeah. I mean, those are very large numbers. Now, mm. I think that the, um, you know, so, so we can do it. And then now the real question is sort of the returns. Now, mm. getting to do the ESG, it's very interesting. Take people like in the insurance industry, which are very hard nosed and just statistically driven. You know, they, they really are starting to price in sort of climate related natural disasters. And part of it is can you insure certain types of projects? So companies that aren't, let's say, concerned about ESG, aren't concerned about the climate, um, won't, I think, perform very well into the future. Because mm. the, the problem is that we are very good at, at dealing with gradual uh, change. Mm. You know, so the, it's like, Every year is warmer on average than mm. the prior years, but it's not like it's one of these catastrophe Hollywood movies. Uh, but suddenly, you know, when things get really bad, mm. then people will be a change in, uh, let's say, perception of investors. Mm. And, and we're seeing it. It's very hard to, um, if you wanted to, to finance a new coal plant. Yeah. Mm. They're just not going to finance it. Mm. Um, so, you know, the, the really sort of hard nose, you know, risk uh, calculators. Are, are much more advanced, I think, than the, the public discourse. Mm. So unfortunately, the whole issue of ESG is becoming politicized. Yeah. In the States, yeah. they use the term woke. Yeah. And it, mm. it's, a, it's interesting. Uh, I think it's 17 attorney generals of the different states have come out and said that their pension funds can't invest in you know, woke companies. companies but, but, but you know, you hear things like that and you think, well, what, what hope <laughs> is there then for investments well, in, in these types of technologies? It's, it's very interesting. Then when you actually talk to the people who manage their funds, yeah. you know, they, they are taking into consideration mm. these risks. Mm. So, so as long as it's, it's not relevant. labeled ESG, it's all right then. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it's, uh, I guess maybe don't be, 
don't offend them in your yeah. <laughs> mm. material or yeah. something, but, mm. but it, it's, it's not having an effect. So in the States, let's say in the prior administration, it was pro-coal. How many coal plants got built in the States? You know, very, very few. So, so what I think is interesting is that the, the perception of investors, mm. the technologies are kind of this somewhat dislocated from the, uh, you know, political discourse. And so, uh, yes, we need government to set the framework. And when I say not get in the way, it means like having the right regulations, um, really mm. pricing externalities. Mm. And this whole discussion about greening the electricity grid, we're not talking about the emission of particulates in, in the cities or in, where you have the areas. And so, for example, take you know, diesel pollution of cars in, in, in Europe. It's tremendous. What is the cost of that? So that's not being included in these equations. Mm. Elizabeth, what role can governments play? Well, look, I think governments have a, a huge role to play, and that's right across the you know, setting the targets from a climate change perspective. If you think about Australia, for example, uh, we've had a change of the federal government last year. We now have far more ambitious climate change targets. It's given a roadmap. Business was already getting on with it, quite frankly. <coughs> mm -hmm. But now, sort of, government's almost catching up with what business was doing. But there's also, we, we need that regulatory environment to support the approval of large scale renewable projects, for example. So I think governments have a role to play. We've seen that in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act. We've seen this week um, with um, you know, that Europe's going to, yeah. to follow that. The proposal out of Underlay. Well. Mm -hmm. So uh, look, government's got a, a significant role to play and government, governments working with industry can help to accelerate that green energy transition because we are actually in a crisis and business as usual, as we know it, is over because yeah. if we don't achieve the goals that have been set, mm -hmm. then you know, we, we are going to see significant changes to, to our planet. And I mm -hmm. just came from a a very powerful session that went mm. with some um, sort of very preeminent scientists talking about the impact that's having right around the globe. So mm. it's real. Governments have a very, very important role to play, um, getting access to skills, mm. making sure we have the migration policies that we need so we get the labour and the resources and the skills that we need. So we, d we, do, need, we do need to work very closely with government. Uh, I don't think it can be business doing one thing, government doing another. It's got to be a coordinated effort. Mm. Uh, I want to ask you, Kavanj, uh, how does the, the spot price of oil affect decision making, do you think, in, in the industry? You know, when oil is trading north of $100, the money is probably going to flow into oil and gas companies because they want to take advantage of those higher spot prices. I think this is a, a challenge for all countries all around the world because oil prices, consequently, the gas prices, they're not really decoupled, and consequently, the power prices. This mm -hmm. impacts to uh, every country at different level. Uh, and the war has triggered also the regular supply uh, flow uh, in the world, especially around Europe. This also changed a lot of dynamics. So that's Europe had to uh, increase, uh, had to pay uh, more cost uh, for the energy, mm -hmm. which uh, mm -hmm. has been imported. And this has also changed some uh, balances uh, throughout the world. And I believe a, a good oil a uh, brand price of around $70 is the right balance for a long-term uh, affordability. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem here is that, uh, again, to the previous question, the role of the governments. Uh, many governments uh, in Europe have applied financial or uh, energy regulatory uh, limitations, price caps, or they are discussing those, but still with some unpredictability. Mm -hmm. I think the predictability here and also differences between European countries, different practices, some subsidies for overall, some subsidies directly. Mm. And as an experience for my country, I'm also experiencing the subsidies in very different way. Mm. And we believe for a better future uh, of predictability. Predictability by the regulators, by the policy makers to secure all those investments. Mm -hmm. Coming back to your previous question about financing. Financing is relatively the easy part of it. We need right policy setting, right supports, right, uh, right incentives mm. for our decisions, for our investments, because we are talking about billions or trillions of dollars every year. Seems like trillions. Yeah. We need to see our way, we need to see a better future.
Thomas, uh, what are the clients that you speak to that Lombard ODA covers? Uh, what type of investments are they looking at and uh, which geographies? I think across the board, we're a global asset manager, so we're looking across these transitions, across different themes, across different geographies. What we're seeing is that certain technologies are at different points of maturity. Mm -hmm. Of course, in certain markets, the economics works slightly differently. The economics of different energy sources depends on local label rates and local access to certain energy sources. So of course you need to take a very local view. What is exciting is that the direction of travel is broadly the same across all geographies. And if anything, we're seeing a little bit of a renewable energy weapon race. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. In the EU, we've got the yeah. EU Green Deal. In China, we see extremely high public and private spending as well on mm. this. So this mm. is no longer a phenomenon yeah. just located in one. Yeah, the train region. has left the station. Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna ask one final question to all of you. If you could give me uh, just a number of where we are today versus stated ambition of where we need to get to. So zero is we've done nothing, mm. 10 is we're there. Where do you think we are today? And where do you think we will be in five years? I would say we're at maybe six today. Okay, it's better and than I thought. Five years, I would say hopefully seven or eight. Okay. Mm, I'd probably say today we're around about four and in five years, yeah, we should be at seven or eight. I'll give you an example. This year, 11% of vehicles were electric. By 2030, we think it's gonna be 60 or 70%. Yeah. From six to 10. From six to ten in in five years' time, it's good to be <laughs> ambitious. Good to ambition. That's my wishful thinking. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all very much. And this was a really fruitful discussion. And I also like that we ended on a positive note because perhaps I started it with a, a bit of a negative spin with, with the global emissions rising. But it is great to see that there are solutions and that you are working on the right solutions that we need to encourage that transition. And it's, it's good to see that the investment appetite is there to accompany it as well. And hopefully we'll be back here in coming years and talking about all the things that we have done rather than looking ahead to what we need to do to bolster this uh, transition further. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.